from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Jeff Whitworth reporting on possible issues with the effectiveness of corn insecticide seed treatments this spring having to do with the slowness of corn seedling growth. And he'll talk as well about wheat head armyworm infestations showing up now in maturing wheat stands around Kansas, which might well be worth controlling, he says. Also today, K-State's Greg Ibendahl will talk about new numbers from the Kansas Farm Management Association on family living expenses for Kansas farms and ranches in 2020. And on this week's wildlife management segment, K-State's Charlie Lee on the performance of a new snake repellent product. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome once more to Agriculture Today. On the line with us from the field is crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth of K-State Research and Extension. We haven't visited with him in a few weeks now. Jeff keeps tabs on what's going on in our field crops in as far as insect damage and what to do about that. Something that is a product very much of our current weather conditions that seem to be persistent, Jeff. What's happening with corn seed treatments the efficacy may be coming into question. Fill us in. Well, good morning. It is, it has been, and it just looks to me like it's going to be uh, more like England weather uh, for the near future. This cloudy, relatively cool uh, weather pattern that we've been in has not been the greatest for the growing conditions. So it's kind of starting to play havoc with some of the seed treatments. Now, when I talk about seed treatments, I'm talking about insecticide seed treatments, Mm -hmm. and most specifically right now, corn, because corn, a lot of folks got out and got it planted back in early April. A lot of the dryland folks had it planted in early to mid-April when the conditions were right, or even late April, Uh, and that's great. And it started to germinate but it's in the last couple of weeks, it's kind of slowed down. Its germination is starting to look a little sluggish, a little chlorotic looking, and uh, hasn't been growing. Well, that's not good in itself, but also the seed treatment that's on the seed that's applied commercially on all the corn commercially available in Kansas that I know of, unless it's specifically ordered without a seed treatment, is treated with an insecticide. And those insecticides do a really good job of protecting the seed, and then they are translocated throughout the seedling uh, for a short period of time. But that's being called into question now, as you said. The insecticide itself will last 21 to 28 days, depending upon the dose applied to the seed. And, And we've tested those Oh, for several years, and those days are really pretty close. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's cool, warm, whatever. That insecticide will be active for 21 to 28 days. So what we're starting to see, and I I saw a field uh, the other day that was attacked by billbugs, and I don't think I've seen a a field attacked by or infested with billbugs probably for 15 or 20 years because seed treatments work really well. But as the seed treatment starts to dissipate, it loses its activity, and as the seedlings just sit there and they're not growing, actively growing as much, these insects are starting to become more active, and you're starting to see the, the damage a little more than we normally would because insecticides are just just not active. So I saw billbug damage, and, and, and those plants are attacked at the base with little white grubs, and they just die. You know, it's just like wireworms or the white grubs, any of them, if they attack the plant, uh, which it can do now because the seed treatments are slowly disintegrating, you'll see the plants just kind of wither 
and then they just die. And that's due to the activity of all these insects that normally are controlled by seed treatment. So as this goes on, as, as the plants continue just to kind of hold their own and not to uh, grow and develop anymore, I'm afraid we're going to start seeing a little more damage by these insects that we haven't been used to seeing damage from just because seed treatments have been so effective. So it's more than just the bill bugs at work out there? Yes, uh, the wireworms are still going to be out there, the seed corn maggots, seed corn beetles, but one of the most dramatically effective insects at shredding plants is the southern corn leaf beetle. Uh, I saw a couple of plants, oh, two days ago, that looked like they had been infested with the southern corn leaf beetle. The plants just looked like they were shredded with a with a leaf shredder, so mm-hmm. if you have a area in your field that the plants are, I mean, seriously, it just looks like a shredder with a, a leaf shredder. That's that's the uh, southern corn leaf beetle, and they're really hard to find insect because they're kind of soil colored and they're, they'll are they fall down to the base of the plant and just lie motionless. you got to sit there for a little bit until they start moving to determine what actually caused it. But, but those, I think, will probably start showing up a little bit here and there as the uh, insecticides become less effective. Wireworms also, if you get plants up to about the six-leaf stage, uh, they can be infested with wireworms. Seed corn maggots, seed corn beetles, white grubs, these all can affect the the seedling stage, even up to the six-leaf stage. The problem is, if you have that, and we're still getting a lot of moisture, it's going to be tough to get out there and do a rescue treatment or a rescue spray. And some of these, all it takes is... uh, a small area to repair the damage and get out and spray the field and the plants will overcome it. Or sometimes you might have to replant. So those are some considerations. Also, some of the guys have already planted their soybeans. Mm -hmm. Some were wondering about whether to use an insecticide treatment on their soybeans. Generally in Kansas, we don't need that. But if you do decide you need to use an insecticide treated seed for soybeans, remember again, 21, 28 days, that's that's the length of protection you get. doesn't matter what the crop is. 21 to 28 days protection from an insecticide seed treatment. Be aware of this expiration date and uh, plan accordingly. You say, Jeff, there are a few things stirring in winter wheat as that crop is now moving toward maturity. One of those is the wheat headworm. It's an army worm that's pretty evident right now. Yes, that's exactly right. As the uh, There's a couple of things right now out in the wheat that are getting folks' attention. One, first of all, is the wheat head armyworm. I've gotten some calls about this, and I've seen a few of these already. Again, as the head's developing, lots of times you go out early in the morning or in the evening, and you look out in your wheat field, and you'll see a worm right up towards the head. Just it looks like they're all stretched out on the stem. That's probably going to be the wheat head army worm. They're slender at both ends. They can be pinkish or greenish with kind of a light stripe. But the problem with the wheat head army worm, they will feed on the grain itself. So a lot of times we don't even notice we have that infestation until we start to harvest the wheat. We get all these worms on the grain or on the on the header or on the, in the truck. And it's just full of worms. That's wheat headed on them. Or when we take the grain in and try and sell it, and you get done for having insect damage kernels, uh, because the wheat headed army worm is one of the few insects that's out in the field that the type of damage that they inflict on the kernel or the grain itself looks like a stored product insect. It's not. It won't live on the grain, just the grain itself, once it's harvested. But that has caused problems in in years past. And this year, we are seeing a few more wheat-headed army worms. And as the next week or two or three go on in the wheat, uh, I'm assuming it's going to start drying down if we get a little better drying conditions. These wheat-headed army worms are going to start moving up. Now, occasionally they'll feed on the flag leaf, but... Generally, they'll get up and feed in on the grain because that's the most succulent part, and they can do a little bit of damage because they're right there feeding on the grain. Now, one caution, in years past, we've had quite a bit of spraying, especially in the western part of the state, 
for wheat-headed armyworms. They are easily killed with an insecticide. They're right up there where they're exposed. Generally, they only feed in the evening or, like I said, early morning or late evening or late afternoon is when you can, if you're actually out looking, you can find them. Otherwise, they'll be hiding around in the soil. But they're right up there on top of the canopy, right up around the head, so that they're well exposed if you decide to treat with an insecticide, which is really, really effective. However, you got to remember the pre-harvest interval. So any insecticide you do use, if you decide to do that, uh, make sure you check the pre-harvest interval, and there's going to be enough time between application of an insecticide and the harvest. Also, I've gotten a couple of calls, just starting to get some calls, about what folks call Miller moths. Miller moths are the adult stage of the army cutworm. But what they're going to do is hang around for a week or two, and then they'll all be gone. They're heading for um, Colorado. That's where they spend the summer up in the mountains. And then those adults will fly back next um, September, October, and lay eggs as they come back and um, start feeding on the alfalfa and the wheat all over again. But after Memorial Day, they're uh, pretty much all headed out to Colorado. So let those run their course, but again, especially when you think about the wheat head army worm, think about the market prices for wheat right now and what sort of infestation you're seeing, why you might want to contemplate treatment, but give it due thought first. Yes, we actually don't have a uh, treatment threshold for uh, wheat headed army worms. Uh, so it's like you said, it's just kind of goes by your experience and the prices seems to be pretty good right now, so um, just take all that under consideration. No lack of insect activity out there in our field crops, as would be anticipated. Thanks for letting us know what's happening. We will catch up again quite soon and get an update on insect pressure coming to bear on those crops, Jeff. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Jeff Whitworth with us, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, and we'll have more for you After this break, you're listening to Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. We had an opportunity just a couple of weeks back now to go over the latest report from the Kansas Farm Management Association at Kansas State University on 2020 net farm income. Joining us is farm management economist Greg Ibendahl, K-State Research and Extension, who has run an analysis not just of those numbers, but in recent years of farm family living expenses, how those fit into the picture and the trends that are worth understanding as one manages one's farm or ranch finances. Let's have you define, Greg, first of all, what is meant by family living expenses. Well, this is kind of like a subset of our main database. So basically what we're doing is we're doing like a family budget like any other family would doing, and we're looking at uh, measuring expenses that are outside the typical farm uh, business expense. So things like you spend on entertainment, recreation, health care, home repairs, that kind of stuff. You know, just like you would a typical family, we're trying to measure to see how actually families actually spend what they're contributing their net farm income toward, and that's basically, you know, their, their cost of living. So you uh, drew this information we'll cover today from the most recent KFMA numbers. Yeah, there's not you know not every farm in our in our database actually does uh, allow us to or allow or wants to keep track of their family living. So there's about a subset. It's probably about 350 or so farms that actually we actually have usable family living data for. And again, this is a subset. But uh, I, th- I think it represents kind of what all farm families in the state are doing, and it's a pretty good idea where families are actually spending most of their money. 
this seems, Greg, to be something of an unsung part of farm financial health. But there's importance to this. Yeah. So anytime you're trying to measure where your expenses are going, it's pretty important. And, you know, for let's say you're a non-farm family uh, trying to figure out where your money's going is an important thing. But th- those families are a little different because their income source every year is pretty much not going to vary a whole lot. Farm families are kind of unique because if you, know, you, if you look at our historical net farm income, the number jumps around quite a bit. But you're a farm family now and you're trying to figure out, well, how am I going to plan my living expenses for those really good years? And and also incorporating those bad, uh, years for net farm income is really low. So I think for farm families, it's really important to kind of keep track of where they're actually spending their money every year. Well, let's get into your analysis. By the way, it's written up on agmanager.info for direct viewing. And the long term here, you have looked back as far as 1993 until recent years to get a handle on what sort of trends we see in this cost category. Yeah, so I'm basically keeping track of family living, really you know, looking at it in two two types of measurements. One is nominal dollars, which is the actual amount you paid every year. Then I also adjusted those dollars into real terms. So I took those dollars spending in the past and basically used the CPI inflation index to kind of make those older dollars equivalent to what the newer dollar was, just to see if there was any real increase in spending. It turns out there actually is, because even on real dollar terms, uh, you know, we went from uh, in, in actual dollars, it was about thirty thousand dollars for family living back in nineteen ninety three. But when you adjust for inflation, that puts that up to fifty thousand dollars. Well, even on real dollar terms, we have increased our farm family living expenses from about fifty thousand dollars back in ninety three to currently we're about seventy thousand dollars. But you say it has somewhat leveled off in recent years. Yeah, I think, I, and, and that's actually going to be kind of one of the next things I'm going to go back and look at is tying this back into off-farm employment, because that's also a source of income, and then tying that back into net farm income as well here. So we kind of saw a pretty steady increase in the family living in real dollar terms, really up through about 2011, 2012. And you think about that, you know, that 2011 or 12 was kind of where net farm income peaked out the first time before we kind of had this five-year law of things going back down a little bit. So, But since about 2012, uh, family living has actually uh, it's been steady and actually probably has gone down a little bit. Well, more to present day and narrowing it down to the new numbers out of 2020, looking at the various categories and interestingly starting with entertainment and recreation, well, the effects of the pandemic are evident here. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you look at back what happened maybe four or five years ago, entertainment and recreation was by far and away our most expensive category and has probably increased by as about as much as anything had to. But if you especially look at this last year, especially, we see like about a $2,000 drop in entertainment and recreation over the last year, which to me is a pretty good indication that farm families were like about every other family in the U.S. You know, they just didn't go out near as much either because they couldn't or they wanted to stay home themselves. So, yeah, I guess from a pandemic perspective, that that certainly lowered our, our spending on entertainment and recreation. But that is one of the more flexible areas of expenditures, isn't well, it? Well, I, I would think so. I mean, you don't want to tell someone they can't recreate <laughs> at all because obviously they'll go crazy to do that. So I think you have to have some entertainment and recreation, but I think there is probably more flexibility in doing that based on what your available cash flow is for the year. So, you know, good years, certainly you could take better trips and those <laughs> kind of things. And in four years, you're going to stay home probably more and, and, and eat home more so instead of going out. So, yeah, I, I think I think the general economy and how much cash you have uh, have a big play in what happens with entertainment and recreation. I should point out, too, that, uh, you know, since, since we had this kind of pandemic year and they didn't spend as much on entertainment and recreation, that category now has shifted down to fourth place, which it had been first place for a long time. So definitely a change in the order there. The one that seems most prominent in folks' minds, though, gets a lot of discussion and deservedly so, health expenses for farm and ranch families. Yeah, that that expense category back when we first had you know usual records back in '93, that category was down into like the two thousand dollar range per year, and it was probably in the middle of the pack when we look at that in relation to all the other expense categories. But that that category has just shot up in time, especially the last uh, twenty years or so, you know, just like a rocket now. So it's it's last three or four years, it has been by far and away our most expensive category, and you know the typical farm family is spending close to twelve thousand dollars a year just on health insurance. That's interesting, Greg, because as we break out other parts of your report, we see that medical expenses, by the same token, have stayed relatively flat. Yeah, so you might think, well, we're spending more on more health insurance. Does that mean, you know, has has that actually lowered our actual health expenditures? And in this case, we would say not because that category has remained fairly steady. You're just paying a lot more money to get what you may have gotten before. Now, the care may be better for what you're doing, maybe more tests or something like that. But certainly there is an increasing 
set of outflow of dollars to get your health needs taken care of these days. That may bear more exploration, it sounds good. Yeah, I think some of my colleagues actually in the department are working on that very issue because that, that is a big thing for most people and they certainly worry about it. And based on what's you know, been happening the last three or four years at least, uh, I don't see that category necessarily going down a lot either here. So it's always going to be something that I think people need to watch out for. Well, then what other family living expenses did you get into in this analysis? Well, we looked at, and again, there's more here on, on the paper than, than actually outside the paper than what I included here. I just kind of put some of the main ones in here. But we had things like contributions, food expenses, household operations, auto gifts, and home repairs. And most of those have kind of stayed kind of steady, but there's a few interesting categories. So back in like... You know, the mid-2013-14, uh, we saw a big jump in home repairs and has since come down. I think that might be tied back into what may have happened with uh, the net farm income and such. So some of those, I think, are being adjusted according to what the net farm income level is as well, too. I want to ask you this. Where does off-farm employment fit into addressing some of the family living expenses? Well, I think that helps smooth out our livable income that we have that people can use for family living. So, you know, obviously, as I mentioned, you know, we, we probably had close to a net record net farm income this year, but you don't have to go back to like, I think, 2015. You know, we had net farm income that was probably in the five or six thousand dollar range. So, you know, a lot of variability in what happens, you know, based on what grain prices are, based on what happens with yields. So net farm income can jump around a lot from year to year. So if you tie that back in and look at what's if you have some off farm income, that can help smooth out those peaks and valleys that you wouldn't have otherwise. So I think you know, a lot of farm families probably do have someone working offside the farm, and, and, and the, I think the main benefit of that is, well, it can provide health insurance for one thing, but the other thing it can do is help smooth out these peaks and valleys of net farm income. Indeed, it does for a lot of farm families out there. Uh, you've been looking at 2020 numbers from the Farm Management Association. Any projections on where farm family living expenses may trend here in 2021? Well, that's going to be a very interesting question because, you know, in 2020, we, we certainly had very far, good net farm income. And I think 2021, as long as yields kind of hold out, we're going to have another really good year for net farm income. But it's going to be interesting to see what farm families do with that extra money coming in. Are they going to, you know, are suddenly we going to see entertainment and recreation jump back up to the forefront again? Or are farm families going to maybe save more of that? That'll be interesting to see. So, yeah, next year will be very interesting to see how these different categories have changed and how they are, what are they, they were doing with their extra profits that we're seeing over the last couple of years. Well, this write-up is available at agmanager.info. Again, it's entitled An Analysis of Family Living in Kansas for 2020 Pertaining to Farm and Ranch Family Living Expenditures. And as a parting thought, Greg, one aspect here of farm and ranch management that maybe deserves more attention on the part of farm families? Yeah, I think so. So, you know, I know based on my own farm experience, you know, a lot of farmers, they are kind of adverse to paying taxes and such, and they want to buy a lot of new equipment whenever they have good farm income. You know, there's pros and cons of that, which we can make in another show. But yeah, certainly I think just because net farm income is so variable, I think farmers, you know, they probably need to have a cushion there, probably more so than most other families do. You know, you hear you hear the, some of the financial experts talk about that families need, you know, probably six months of extra expenses to handle a downturn. I think farm families probably need at least that amount to cover some of these down years of farming. So you'd like to see it as a standard component of family income management? Yes, for sure. Very well. Have a look at the write-up, agmanager.info. Interesting information indeed. Thanks for going over it with us, Greg. Appreciate your time. Thanks. He's a farm management economist, K-State Research and Extension, Greg Ibendahl. Now a few moments away. When we come back, we'll get into today's agricultural news headlines. Also, K-State's Mike Brook with Milk Lines. And another visit with K-State's Charlie Lee on wildlife management. All of that is still ahead here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. 
You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here, and next up, today's agricultural news headlines in brief for you. Beginning with this week's Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report from the USDA. And for the week ending this past Sunday, our top soil moisture in the state, 18% surplus now, 73% adequate, and only 9% short to very short. Subsoil moisture at 11% surplus, 75% adequate, and only 14% short to very short. The condition of the winter wheat crop in the state now up to 55%, good to excellent, 30% fair, 15% poor to very poor, winter wheat headed now at 84%, and the wheat turning color is now at 2%. Corn planting in Kansas, 76% complete, that's very near the average, and emergence at 56%, again near the average. Soybeans planted, 51% now, that's well ahead of the 36% average, Emergence, 27% ahead of the 18% average. And grain sorghum planted now at 12%. That's near the average. Range and pasture conditions in the state this week then are called 60% good to excellent, 32% fair, and 8% poor to very poor. Now, the USDA's latest corn and soybean outlooks nationally show that planting and emergence are ahead of the average pace for both crops. Here's more from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. What is USDA's latest outlook for corn planting? We're getting pretty close to the end of the corn planting season. 90% of the intended acreage planted by May 23rd, 10 points ahead of the five-year average, also ahead of last year's 87% at this time. That was USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey. Corn emergence on May 23rd continues to outpace the normal. 64% of the acreage emerged by May 23rd, well ahead of the five-year average of 54%. Also ahead of last year's 61%. Meanwhile, very similar picture as we look at the soybean crops for the week ending May 23rd. Three quarters of the acreage in the ground on that date, well ahead of the five-year average of 54% significantly ahead of last year's 63 percent. He says warm weather is pushing soybean emergence well ahead of the five-year average and ahead of last year's pace. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And winter wheat condition nationally fell again slightly last week to 47 percent good to excellent. That was down a percentage point from the previous week. The current condition of the winter wheat crop still below last year's rating of 54 percent good to excellent, according to the USD. Also in the headlines today, senior EPA officials deliberately mishandled the agency's 2018 registration decision for three dicamba herbicides, Fexapan, Extendamax, and Ingenia. That's according to the agency's own Office of Inspector General. The OIG issued a scathing report yesterday outlining a number of mistakes made by the agency, including scuttled internal scientific reviews and deliberate manipulation of scientific documents by senior EPA officials, according to that office. Staff scientists at the agency told the OIG inspectors that they felt muted and constrained in their ability to voice problems with the registration, and at least one had feared retaliation within the agency if they did so. Ultimately, the report concludes these problems and mistakes led to a federal appeals court vacating all three herbicide registrations in June of 2020. Now, again, those products were registered, uh, uh, two of the three, in October of 2020 once more. It's not immediately clear clear what this OIG's report means for current dicamba herbicides. Next up, this week's edition of Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brooks standing by. Mike? Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning some things that we might be looking at in terms of controlling cost and looking at how we reinvest on our dairy farms in the next year or two. You know, as we look at where our margins are at today... And as we look at where we're at on feed prices, one of the things that we need to think about as dairy farmers is how do we control cost on our farm? Well, one of the best things that a dairy farmer can do, especially if they raise their own feeds, is to look at how they raise higher quality feeds. 
So when you think about the $7.50 corn you're buying and maybe the uh, soybean meal that's running $450 a ton, you might want to think about how you control your feed costs by doing the following things. Number one, your home-raised feeds are worth a lot today, and likely we can raise feeds a whole lot cheaper than we can buy feeds. This isn't always true, and many times in many years that's not the case, but in this year that is probably the case. So concentrating on what you can do to increase the crude protein that you actually harvest, in other words, harvesting your alfalfa a little bit earlier so it has a higher protein content, letting your corn silage develop just a little bit further so it has more starch in it, and then concentrating on fiber digestibility is a huge thing that you can do to reduce the amount of feeds that you might have to purchase off-farm. Another thing, spend some time with your nutritionist. Maybe you've been feeding a one-group TMR, and maybe you need to switch to two different TMRs on your farm, a high group and a low group. Why would you do that? Well, you know, if you think about a dairy herd and and your cow's eating about 56 pounds of dry matter per day, if you lower the crude protein percentage in that low group by just half of a percent, That would be equivalent to reducing the amount of soybean meal that you feed per cow per day by about a half pound. That would save you 22 to 23 cents per cow per day for those animals fed that diet. So have a serious conversation with your nutritionist. There may be some ways that you can save on protein costs without sacrificing milk production by dividing your herd into a couple of different production groups. Then the final thing to think about is how you're going to reinvest in your dairy operation. Focus on things that may increase increase returns in the short term, things like heat stress management, things that may increase your efficiency of labor usage. And look at the big picture things like the amount of time you're spending on breeding, the amount of time you spend at the milking parlor, and then also ways that you might be able to modernize and also reduce the time spent feeding. Finally, look at how you increase milk production, milk flow off the farm, whether that be increasing the number of cows a little bit on your farm or increasing the amount of milk harvested per cow each day, or a combination of the two. Keep in mind that probably we're not going to see very much of an increase in milk price, and a lot of this will actually be offset by higher feed costs in 2021. So concentrating on some of these things that we've visited about would be important in trying to improve the margin level on your dairy farm. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And we'll be back with more shortly. You're listening to Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Concluding this agriculture today, it's once more our visit on wildlife management featuring former wildlife specialist Charlie Lee, K-State Research and Extension. The spotlight today, Charlie, is on another evaluation of a repellent product, in this case for snakes. And actually, these kinds of products have been on the market for quite a while, haven't they? They certainly have, for whatever reason, and and there are many, and I've seemed to have heard them, maybe all of them, over my career as a wildlife specialist. Some people are deathly afraid of snakes Mm -hmm. and will go to an unusual amount of expense to try to keep them away from an area. And the desire to repel snakes is certainly not a new concept, but unfortunately the identification of compounds that are actually effective has been limited. There is a lot of materials that have been tested. Some of them that I can recall would be DDT, rotenone, uh, arsenic, chloridane, nicotine sulfate, and there's various gases. Then there have been home remedies that have been tested, including mothballs and sulfur and cedar oil and lime and coal tar and liquid smoke. Even artificial skunk scent has been documented as being tested as a snake repellent. 
Of those that I just mentioned, some of those compounds were lethal, but none were reported to be effective as a repellent in any of those studies. Well, there's been a new entry to the lineup of repellents that earned testing recently? Yes, there has been an addition to some of the commercially marketed repellents, which presumably have some sort of uh, efficacy data before they could get a registration. But one called Snake Away uh, that is on the market currently, uh, and the other one would be Liquid Fence or Shoe Snake. There are uh, three products that I know are available commercially. Now there's a product on the market that seems to have some effectiveness. It's called Melorganite. It's a biosolids byproduct that's left over from activated sludge process from the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewer District. It's shown some potential as a repellent for deer, and there seems to be some potential for non-venomous snakes. And that comes from a recent field trial testing this product out. You might go over the, the process there and then the results. Well, uh, the, the study was conducted at the Berry College uh, in Georgia. It was actually done at the, the sheep center there. Uh, was an area outside facility that was not being used for grazing of sheep at, during the time the study was conducted. It was primarily fescue and other planted grasses with some forested areas uh, within the, the area that was used as the experimental trial. And that's a unique part of this study. It was an outdoor setting as opposed to previous trials with other products? Yes, this was outside. Previous trials had looked at it in inside, either in a lab-type situation or in rooms where basically snakes didn't have options. Uh, this began with the construction of a snake enclosure where they had dug a one-foot trench around a 30-yard by 30-yard uh, square plot. Uh, then they fenced that plot with a combination of wood post and T-post uh, and with an electric wire on the top, and the fencing material was actually black plastic. The electric wire was just energized with a fencer that was a solar-powered charger with an output of about 5,000 volts that was commercially available. Then they captured mature wild rat snakes, hand-captured, placed in aquariums, provided water and food, fitted with a radio transmitter, and then fed a mouse to keep, kind of get them all on the same nutritional plane, and then were released into the exclosure. Uh, during three different uh, release periods, five to six snakes were released, depending upon the, the amount of snakes that they had at the time, and typically the snakes were released within 48 hours after being captured. During the first two-day release periods with no milorganite treatment, the snakes were contained within the enclosure for a duration of about nine hours total before escaping. That seemed like a lot of work for a nine-hour effective treatment. Uh, then during period three, they had the same setup, but they also applied the milorganite uh, by hand in a 15-inch with strip around the interior perimeter of the enclosure fence. During period three, all of the snakes remained within that enclosure throughout the seven-day treatment period, but I think it's important to note that one of the snakes died within the enclosure on day six of the seven-day period. They could not document a specific cause of death even after a necropsy. All told, then, that's a pretty high level of efficacy exhibited by this product used in that manner. Yeah, I mean, most people would say if uh, you put seven snakes in, a, in an area and there none are able to escape, that seems to be a pretty high level of success. Keep in mind, I've not seen these results uh, replicated in other places. I'm sure there are a lot of people that are using milorganite because it is widely available and it's been documented to reduce damage from deer to ornamental plants and food crops. And it supposedly works through an olfactory system of snakes, meaning that it disrupts the odor sampling ability of snakes and causes them to turn away from the area. So at least uh, the research that was developed and reported on here 
shows that it certainly has uh, additional evidence that it has some potential, particularly for rat snakes. Even so, you'd rather that folks didn't abandon the tried and true ways of dealing with snakes that uh, you've talked of many times in favor of merely a repellent use. Yes, I always will go back to using the acronym HER, H-E-R. Use habitat modification first to try to reduce the suitability of the location for whatever species you're wanting to avoid the area. Then use uh, exclosure. Try to develop some way to keep the things that you want to protect away from the animals that you don't want involved. And then finally, the R is remove those individuals, either dead or alive, by whatever techniques that you have to accomplish the the task. Those practices still have merit. Charlie, thanks for letting us know how this particular repellent product fared in that efficacy trial. Charlie Lee, longtime wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. He's along with us every Tuesday right here. And that's our time for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.